are going to be talking this morning uh, about the church, continuing our series in Acts and looking at the topic of the church. The topic of the church even sounds like a funny sentence, doesn't it? Because the church is not a topic, it's not an idea, but this is what we're preaching on this morning. I want to ask you a question. What do you think about when you think about church? What's the first thing that pops into your head when you think about this thing we call church? A.W. Tozer once said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And I think there's some truth in that. What comes into your mind when you think about the person of God, and this is true for every person on the earth, what you think about God is probably the most important thing about you. It will shape you, it will shape your life, it will shape your destiny, it will shape your eternity. Probably more important than that is what does God think about you? That's probably the only thing that trumps that. So what you think about God is the most important thing about you other than what God thinks about you. What does God think about you? Does God love you? Is he for you? Is he with you? And that shapes what you're thinking about him. But I want to put it to you this morning... That what you think about church, how you engage with church life, will be directly linked to your growth and maturity as a Christian. Directly linked. What you think about when you think about church will shape the Christian that you become, will shape your walk with God. It will shape everything about your spiritual life. It really, really will. There are so many misconceptions about church, and I had all of them before I came to know Jesus. All of them. I used to think that this, I used to pass this building quite regularly and I used to think it was called the bridge because we had a little thing on the corner with a sign up saying the bridge. So I used to think it was called the the bridge church and I thought the church was mainly, when you spoke about church, you spoke about a building. That's the most common one, right? Did anybody else used to believe that? Church is just a building, yeah? It's just a physical building. And it's funny how we all know, in fact, if you've been discipled by John Wheeler or been under his ministry for any amount of time, if you say the church when you're referring to the church building, he will immediately correct you. And you say, where are we meeting? And if someone says we're meeting at the church, he'll go, church building. And so it's now been worked into my vocabulary that we never, have, my kids have got it. It's amazing. They're four and six and they won't say, they'll only ever say, are we going to the church building? It's always a two phrase thing. But it's an easy misconception to get into our own thinking. If you think of church as just a building, you'll struggle to meet with God outside the four walls of a special place. Really, faith and spiritual life will not take place for you outside of this. I want to tell you today and break down the misconception, there is nothing special about this building other than the fact of the people that meet within it. That's it used to be an elastic band factory, I think, at one stage. Station we wear. There we go. How spiritually wonderful that is. What spiritual heritage this building has. <laughs> Doesn't matter. The spiritual heritage of the people is what matters. That's the only raspberry you'll get from me today, I promise. I'm sorry. Another misconception about church, and it came up in the prayer meeting this morning, is that church is just a tradition. It's just a set of routines that we go through. It's just something that's very, very old and has somehow managed to remain and stay for ages and ages and ages. If you believe that church is just a tradition, well, that's a hard thing to say. If you believe that church is just a tradition, you'll attend because you have to, because tradition dictates that you have to, and you'll struggle with any change or any suggestion of something new. If you're a person who naturally struggles with change in church life, maybe ask the question, am I valuing tradition more than I'm valuing true church? Obviously, we have traditions. We have things that have been laid down for us from of old, which are very, very, very good. But actually, our value is not in the tradition. We'll get on to what we do value in a minute. You might think or use church as a verb. Church is something we do. What are you doing this weekend? Oh, we do church. Are we doing church right now? Have you ever said something like that? Maybe you've been in a small group or a small setting or a prayer meeting and you start to have discussion. Well, is this church? Are we doing church now? Are we doing church today? If you believe that church is just something that you do, then you'll value an event 
or a ministry more than you value the quality of relationship. If church is just something that you come and do, then you'll care more about the quality of the worship leader, the quality of the preacher, and aren't you blessed today? Sorry, everybody. (laughs) The quality of how good the sound is, how good is the event, how good is the show? Was the lighting right? Was the temperature okay in the building? Was the coffee any good? Because if church is just something I do, if it's just an event I go to attend, then those things are going to be predominant in our thinking. But actually, over and above that, we must know that the church is a people. It's a people. It's not an event. If you're on Instagram, I implore you to follow an account called Worship Fails. It is utterly brilliant. It is a collection of videos right across Christendom of big fancy church events where stuff goes wrong during praise and worship. And often you've got uh, lighting and you've got smoke machines and it's dark and it's powerful, it's intense. There's nothing wrong with some of these things, but uh, you've got them all set up and then the band will have a backing track playing and the backing track will utterly fail. And so you'll have a moment where there's a wonderful one with Martin Smith, lead singer of Delirious, who's playing a keyboard and he's behind the keyboard at the time and it's a real like intimate moment. He's like, yeah, just lovely pad sound, and then he accidentally puts his Bible down on a drum machine, and the drummer's thing starts to go He turns around and looks at the drummer and blames the drummer, and it takes him a while to realize that it's him. I love those moments. I live for those moments. I know I, I, I love to worship. I love flow. I love to, to worship excellently, but I really enjoy it when stuff goes wrong because it reminds me and reminds all of us that this is not a show. It's not an event. This is not a professional performance. We're a family. We're a family. I've I've had the privilege of training different worship teams from different churches. And people get so upset and uptight about making a mistake. I'm just like, just let it go. Let it go. This is a personal opinion, so please don't, you know. But why do you need a backing track? I'm not sure they had that in the early church. Why are you trying to sound like Hillsong? Just get a guitar. Put the guitar down. Just lift your voices. Do you know what I mean? We need to bin off this idea that church is a show or an event and get back to the root of what church really, really is. And we'll get there. Another misconception is that church is an optional add-on to the Christian life. If church is an optional add-on to you, I'm going to tell you there will always be, or at least very, very regularly be, something more important for you to do. There'll be something that creeps in, a a meeting that you might have, or something that your kid wants to go and do. Something, these things can come, they're very innocent often, sometimes there's nothing wrong with those things, but actually if church is not prioritised in our thinking, if it's an optional add-on, then we'll never ever really fully be able to commit. Also, church gets a bad rap, doesn't it? Negative stories in the press, you hear of church numbers in decline, If you follow the most recent stories, we are outdated and old-fashioned. The church is no longer relevant. You even hear this sometimes from Christians. I've heard good Christians that I love, and I understand why they say this as well. But I've heard it said to me by church leaders before, I'm glad I met Jesus before I met the church. Now, I understand that thinking, because churches aren't perfect. Sometimes you meet groups of people and you think, wow, really, Jesus, this lot? Not us, the church down the road. (laughs) But church can get a bad rap outside of Christians, and it can get a bad rap with Christians as well. I do understand where some of these views come from, but when I compare them to what the Bible says about church, it could not be more different. You will not find any of those views in this book whatsoever when it comes to church life. What you find about church is that it's about people. The church is a group of people. We're a people. The church is you. The church is me. The church has always been and always will be people. It means that if this building burns down tomorrow, the church is not in crisis. We're still here. We still exist. We don't need these extra add-on things to make up what church is. The church is us. And it's not just any people. 
The church is precious. She is valuable. This is what the Bible says. She's beautiful. She's wonderful. She's awesome. She is miraculous. She is eternal. In Jesus' eyes, she is literally to die for. Do you think about that when you think about church? Is this just something we come to? Jesus thought she was worth dying for. She is the bride of Christ. She's his body on the earth. She's the family of God. She is a living temple. She's holy and blameless before God. She is awesome as an army with banners. She's joy. She's the joy that was set before Jesus so that he might endure the cross. When Jesus is in the garden thinking about and sweating drops of blood, deep levels of anxiety and trying to work out, I don't want to do this. I I know where I'm destined to go. I'm going to that cross and it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt like nothing has hurt anyone before. I'm going to bear the shame and the sin and the iniquity of the entire world is going to happen. And he prays that prayer, Lord, please, if, if there's any other way, if there's anything else I can do, if there's any other way of dealing with this, please take this cup away from me. And then he says, not my will, but your will be done. And he submits his will to the will of the Father. But the joy we're told that helps him to endure it and makes him go and bear his face and take the spitting and the scoffing and the shame, to take the accusations, to take the whipping, to take the nails through his hands, to take the nails through his feet, to stand there and suffocate and essentially drown as his own bodily fluids fill up within his chest. The thing that he held in his mind and his heart, the thing that made him endure it, was the church. The church. She is the joy for which he endured the cross. She's the dwelling place of God. The city set on a hill. She's the chief display of God's glory on the earth. The place where he makes known and displays his manifold wisdom to the whole world. She is loved, faithfully loved. She has a destiny and a purpose. She's the very home of the promises of God. Please forgive me for being so bold, but don't ever talk to me about boring church. It doesn't exist. Something miraculous right now is taking place as we gather together corporately. There is power and promise in this meeting. I know sometimes over-familiarity can breed contempt. I don't mean contempt, that's a very strong word. But it can lessen our understanding of what is actually taking place when we come together. What is actually taking place when we corporately meet. This is a wonderful, miraculous privilege. To clarify, church is people. It's me and it's you. But you all knew that, right? Right, great. (laughs) The New Testament word uh, for church, which uh, is our translated word church, is ecclesia. It literally means a called out assembly of people. Therefore, it can never be used as a verb and it should never be used to describe a building. It's a called out assembly of people. It's us. We must never forget this. The church is made up of people, not a physical building, not a tradition, not an event, not a ministry, a people, precious and redeemed. And in Acts, we get our birth story. This is the start where the the spirit lit the flame and the church was born. And that's where we're going to go today. So please turn to Acts chapter 2. We're going to look at what this early church did. It's funny talking about birth stories. Birth stories are very important. I always laugh when we have a friend, uh, friends of ours are pregnant or a baby comes. And if you speak to the husband, often I'll use Ben as as an example because Ben's out um, and Becky had a baby recently. And Ben texts to say, baby's been born. And I text back and said, great got a name he said not yet I said okay no worries and I told Tessa this story uh, and said oh Becky's had the baby she went brilliant what's the name what's the weight what's the gender what's this and I was like oh I don't know I've got no idea (laughs) you just get bullet points with guys last night we sat around the dinner table at my in-laws house and uh, Tess and my sister-in-law Sarah start sharing birth stories of our children and um, my my two nephews 
And it could not, it's like chalk and cheese. Because rather than the bullet point version, you get intricate, very, very intricate detail. Very intricate detail. Don't eat dinner whilst ladies are telling birth stories. <laughs> Why do women do this? Because it's important. Because this child has value. Actually, the pain and the complications and the twists and the turns are not just entertaining stories. They're because something very, very precious was being born. Something very, very precious was being birthed. And it's life-changing. It's life-changing. And it's important for us to know our birth story as the church. And this is it in Acts. We have it in Acts. The world loves an origin story at the moment. If you're a comic book fan, you've got almost every comic book hero ever has his origin story made into a film that you can go and watch. It's really important that we know where we've come from. And so I want to look at a few things throughout the book of Acts that we can learn from this early church. So we're in Acts chapter 2, and we're at verse 42 through to 47. It says this, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds uh, to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. They devoted themselves They were a devoted people. Something had happened which joined them together in such a way that was just beyond a normal acquaintance. They were devoted to God and they were devoted to one another. I can't dwell too much on this because John's going to preach a whole sermon on devotion in a few weeks' time. But that word devotion, essentially when you look at the way it's broken down, I'll do your job for you, John, it's okay. (laughs) We'll watch a film that week or something, it'll be fine. (laughs) <laughs> that word devotion essentially means to continually endure or to continually give yourself to. This was not a one-off thing. The church was setting up their way of life. When it said they devoted themselves, that wasn't for a week. It wasn't for a season. It was the structure of the church that has spread from this moment right up until now, really. The church is made up of devoted people. Isn't that Christ-like? That sort of level of devotion. There's something about catching Christ's heart for the church that shapes your thinking. It changes you. If you struggle with the concept of church, if you struggle with church in general, with being able to be affectionate towards the idea of church, or even accepting towards the idea of this corporate body, this people coming together, if you're a bit of a, uh, a person who likes to be isolated maybe by your nature... Dwell on what Jesus thinks about the church. It's a great thing to do. It's a great way to transform your thinking. As you fall in love with him, you start to fall in love with the things that he loves. As you get closer to Christ, as you get closer to him, as you press into him in your personal times and in your, as you read the word, what you'll discover is that Jesus is incredibly passionate about his church. And I think often we lose this. Maybe in our, in our personal devotions, sometimes we... I, look, I don't want to overstate this. It's a really good thing to apply the promises of God to yourself. It's a really good thing to have that personal... In fact, it's vital to build and continue to build that personal relationship between you and the living God. What a wonderful thing to do. But as you do that and as you give yourself to that, what you should see, especially as you read the Bible is that God is, is not just about the ones and twos. He's interested in a people. Yes, he loves you personally. Yes, he died for you personally. Yes, he paid the price for your sin personally. But it was for the purpose of joining you together to this great thing he's doing called the church. As you spend time with him, you'll fall in love with the things that he loves. I noticed this in my own marriage. When we got married uh, nearly 10 years ago now, 10 years this February for Tessa and I, um, 
It was about the same time that you got the first few series of The Great British Bake Off. <laughs> now, if you'd said to me 10 years ago, do you want to watch this show? What's it called? It's called The Great British Bake Off. What's it about? It's about a bunch of people in a tent, and they make cakes. And then the cakes are judged, and you know they get score, and then someone's voted out each week, and then there's a final, and you get a winner. Now, as a 23-year-old man, I'd have said, there is nothing I want to watch less. <laughs> there is nothing I want to watch less. What a boring show that must be. Bunch of sweaty people in the tent trying to make a cake. How is that entertainment? Then I married my wife, and those of you who know us will know that my wife is an exceptionally good baker. She's very, very, very good. She's very passionate about it. She loves the intricacy of design. She loves to branch out and try things that she's not tried before. And actually, she's a massive fan and has always been a massive fan of the Great British Bake Off. <laughs> and what I found over time, as I've spent time with her and watched her passion for this thing called baking develop and grow and watched her get better at it and more interested in it, I've been like, oh yeah, I'm like this. That's really good what you made there. That's really good. And suddenly now, I'm watching Bake Off shouting at the television. <laughs> No, Susan, don't put the flour in now. I can't believe you've used cold water. Why are you using cold water? It's got to be hot water, Susan. Or whoever. Sorry if you're hearing your name. So sad, isn't it, John? Sad. I'm now vehemently passionate about the Great British Bake Off. For me, top three shows on television right now. Anybody with me? Amen. Amen. We'll just give the benediction. We'll go home. This is what you need to learn from today. How has this change taken place in me? Because I spent time with my wife. Because I love her. Because her passion has rubbed off on me and we've started to transform one another. It's exactly the same with God. As you spend time with Jesus, as you get close to him, as you press into him, as you learn to love the things that he loves, he will give you a love for the church. As you catch a, gimp, a glimpse of Christ's love for the church in your own salvation uh, story. As you spend time with him, let him shape your devotion to the church. He is so devoted to his bride. He's a very, very good husband. So devoted to his bride. That's why Paul, am I nicking all your stuff, John? I'm so sorry. We'll go over it again. <laughs> Don't take notes because you'll be able to do it. John will do this better than me in a few weeks' time. That's why Paul uses marriage in Ephesians to unpack and describe how Christ feels about the church. He says this in Ephesians 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her. Get this image in your head as you read this. Having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we're members of his body. Paul uses this incredibly intimate image it really is a very intimate image of Christ washing his bride with the word. Essentially, he's the bridegroom, but he's preparing his bride for her wedding day. He's taking the time, the detail to get her ready. Cherishing her and loving her. And then he encourages husbands to do the same. Husbands, how are you doing with that? Room for improvement? Me too. <laughs> again dwell on how christ loves his church let it shape you let it change you jesus loves the church and so should we so they were devoted to one another that's the first thing i want to look at from uh, the church in Acts. they were a devoted people secondly they were diverse remarkably diverse and yet they utterly valued unity above almost every other value it was incredibly important that their diversity was maintained in unity. I've got a question for you this morning. What is the greatest threat to Christ's central church today? 
Oh, you're giving away my answer. All right, let me give you some options. Persecution. No. The rise of Islam. The theory of evolution. No? Not going to wipe us out? How about an economic crash? What if every church member lost their job overnight? Still here? Brexit. Are you sure? Because the way that some of us preach about our Brexit arguments are much more vehement than we ever preach about our passion for the church. It's a little bit tongue-in-cheek with a little bit of seriousness in it. (laughs) What about the LGBTQ agenda? It's not going to wipe the church out. The biggest threat to our church, and to any church really, is disunity. Division. Things that drive us apart. So in Acts, as we see the church spread from Jerusalem out into Judea, over into Samaria and into the nations of the world, we see God building an incredibly diverse group of people. Jews and Gentiles being brought into the same family, people from different races, backgrounds, traditions, religions, the rich, the poor, men, women, children, all joined together as this glorious new people. Just this big, massive melting pot of just amazing diversity. When you put this many different people together in a community and you call them to be as devoted as Jesus calls them to be to one another, things can get sticky. Sometimes we fall out. Sometimes we clash against one another. Sometimes we have disagreements. And there can be disagreements and differences of opinions. And that is why we have quite a few of the epistles. (laughs) Quite a few of the letters that the apostles wrote are directly linked to how does this work then? If you have this group of people who believe this and come from this background, and this group of people who believe this and come from that background, how on earth do they come together as one? How does that work? And so the apostles are at strains. They're at great efforts and go to great lengths to point out that even though we are diverse and that is a glorifying thing, praise God for this church, I mean, look around. We have people from different nations, different colors, different backgrounds. We're from different, some of us are from different religions originally and stuff like that. Actually, he's brought us together and we are wonderfully diverse. But our diversity means nothing if we don't have unity. We're just like Channel 4, trying to tick boxes for the sake of it. Yeah? Yeah? got to make sure we have someone from each different race and stuff like that. It's important that that exists, but that's not how the church works. We are to be utterly diverse and united, not in spite of our diversity, but with it. They are, the apostles are uncompromising in their pursuit of unity. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree. And that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. And then he adds on this, For it's been reported to me by Chloe's people that there's quarrelling among you, my brothers. See, it always escapes my mind that Paul's letters were often, in fact most of them, all of them really, were read publicly before the whole church. And in quite a few of his letters, he is happy to name and shame people who keep falling out. I think in Philippians, it might be Philippians, I hope I got this right, he names two ladies and he says, they both love God and they both worked with me, please tell them to sort it out. Can you imagine us doing that on a Sunday morning? (laughs) Me getting up and saying, I entreat you, Sonji. Who am I going to pick on? And you, Shirley. So please pack it in, all right? Stop falling out and get on with each other. And it's your responsibility, Christ Central Church, to make sure that that happens. Now, I've never done that before. (laughs) Have you ever done that before, John? No, he hasn't. (laughs) You know when you ask a question, you're like, what have I done? Oh, no. (laughs) But the truth of it is true. 
So often we slip into gossip or we let little roots of bitterness take place and take hold. And actually our unity is so, so precious. So, 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 so important. That is our corporate responsibility, Christ Central Church, to make sure that we remain united. We have to help each other out. And so Sonji and Shirley, I'll see you afterwards. <laughs> In Colossians chapter 3. Paul writes, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgive each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect unity or harmony. Ephesians 4, Paul writes, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all. And in all. Paul goes on and he keeps talking. It goes on in chapter 4. He says, He gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers to equip the saints for work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until what? We all attain the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's fascinating. That Paul would give that Paul, that God would give gifts, evangelists, prophets, teachers, pastors. I've missed one, haven't I? Apostles, thank you very much, John. That he would give those gifts to bless the church and that they might exist and point us all towards the goal of maturity, and what maturity looks like is unity of the faith. It's us being together and alongside one another. Last one I'll read for this section is in Philippians. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy, says Paul, by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. That's the key. That's the key to unity. That's how you get there. If you can count others as more significant than yourself, if you can hold others up, even when they've hurt you and let you down, that will drive us to unity. I could go on, but you can't get away from it. It's in every single epistle. There is an encouragement to be united and to be together. Brothers and sisters, we must value the unity of the faith above any diverse opinion. Our unity must outrank our racial and ethnic differences, our economic differences. It must outrank past hurts and grudges. It must outrank gossip and slander. It must outrank our political leanings. It must. Nothing must come above our need to be united. And so they were utterly diverse and they were utterly united. Another thing that I want us to notice from the church in Acts is they were devoted to one another. And they knew they needed each other. Sorry, John. (laughs) I keep apologizing. They knew they needed each other. Almost every single chapter in the book of Acts has at least one use of the phrase, and they were all together, or something very similar. They loved being together. They valued it. They needed it. They they couldn't get away from it. It, It's in our text that we read earlier in Acts chapter 2. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to breaking of bread, to prayer. These are things that they do together. And all, I'm skipping down now, all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, attending the temple together. And breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This is 
radical living, a radical dependency on one another, a radical need to be together, to continue to meet together, not just once a week, not just twice a month, but as often as possible. It was such a priority for them to be meeting together. It's radical, and yet it's so simple. It's so, so simple. That essentially that when these men and women came into the church and started to belong to the family of God, everything else almost became less important. The priority in their lives now was this new family that they belonged to. So much so, they were so devoted to one another that they'd sell up their possessions and distribute it as any had need. Some of you are fantastic at this. As soon as you get a whiff of, oh, there's a little need over there, you're on it. And you meet it straight away. And well done. That is superb. But these guys are just on a, a level above, it seems like. They are so utterly devoted to one another. The world, the flesh, and the devil will do everything to pull us apart. But actually, the world needs this radical message of togetherness. It's 2019, and we have more ways than ever to be connected to one another. Through the internet, through social media, through all sorts of other things. And and when these things were made and built, there was this expectation that it would drive people together, that it would make the world more connected because now I can be friends and connected up with my friends all over the world and South Africa and I can be connected up to people of the same opinion as me and different opinions as me. And and surely when this thing is launched called social media and the internet, it's going to connect up and the world will become more united and more harmonious, right? That didn't happen. (laughs) It's gone the other way. Actually now, I think we're more divided in our society and our culture than we've ever been before. And the UK has a minister for loneliness. That is shameful. I mean, I don't know if you guys are into repenting on behalf of your nation, but that just makes me want to get before God and go, Lord, what have we done? How is this possible? What have we come to value so much that now we need a minister for loneliness because there is an epidemic that is widespread across this nation of people who who are lonely, utterly lonely. And our prayer in this moment must be, God, would you raise up the church? Would you raise up this miraculous thing that you're doing of this group of people that come together and genuinely love one another? They are genuinely, they genuinely care for one another. Do you know what? That was the biggest thing that made an impact for me when I came through the doors here as a non-believer. I didn't know what to expect when I walked into Penge Family Church as it was then. Had no idea whatsoever. I was expecting pews. I was expecting a man in a dress. John had chosen to wear a suit that day, which I was very, very grateful for. I was expecting an organ and some old hymns, but more than anything else, I was expecting stuffy people who had turned up because they felt they had to. And yeah, the worship made an impact on me and the preaching obviously pricked my ears up and I was listening to it. But the thing that stands out the most, that stood out the most, was that there was this group of people who actually liked being together. They stuck around afterwards and had coffee and tea. They would chat and sit and pray for one another and care for one another. Within moments, I was invited to somebody's house that Sunday afternoon to have dinner there and then a midweek group after that and to come along. And it was like, come, come, come and belong to the family. Come and get involved. Come and be. It was so impactful. My life at home at the time was falling apart. My parents were getting divorced. It was just, there was just brokenness everywhere. Everywhere I looked, it was just broken, broken, broken. And to walk into this building and to find a people that genuinely cared for each other made a huge impact. We have a message to the world, guys. We have a message to the world. But it will only ever be as powerful as our devotion to one another. How are you doing? 
you get the value of church? Do you get actually the power in this? We can do so much more together than we can apart. There is great power in our joining. We must always remember that Christ is returning for a corporate people. Biblically, it's our love for one another that is the greatest witness to the world that God exists and his kingdom is advancing. Did you know that? That's the greatest witness, biblically. Not signs and wonders, although they're great and we long for them and we pray for them and we want to see them. But actually the greatest witness to the world that God is on his throne, that he's ruling and reigning and that the kingdom is advancing is that we love one another. Because it's a miraculous thing. We're all from different backgrounds and different walks. And yet, because we're united under Christ, because we've received his love, his forgiveness, because God has adopted us into his family, now he causes us and calls us to love one another. And that love is a display and a sign to the world that God is real. And so we must be those who give ourselves to that love. Jesus prays for it in John 17. It's my favorite prayer in the whole Bible. Let's turn there. Let's just read through it very, very, very quickly. John 17. What's the time? How are we doing? We're okay. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all flesh to give him eternal life, uh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. It's a wonderful prayer that God, we've, we've existed for eternity, Father. This is Jesus speaking, me and you together. Before the world existed, before anything was created, there was a Father loving his Son by the Spirit. A perfect unity and nothing changed when Jesus arrived on earth. He continued to glorify his Father and to live with him and to follow his will. They were completely and utterly united. He goes on, verse uh, 6. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they've kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, all and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are one. That's mental. This is the God of the universe who is perfectly united in Trinitarian harmony and always has been. Cannot be broken, cannot, no gap, no disunity, no disagreement, no difference of opinion. They are completely together all the time. And they pray, and Jesus prays, and this has always been true. And now, Lord, please, for those who would belong to me, make them one together as we are one. This is a new level of unity we're being called to. This is a new level of love, a new level of devotion. I've completely lost my place. Verse 12. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you've given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I'm coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. What's Jesus' joy? It's the church. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them because they're not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also 
may be sanctified in truth. And then from verse 20 onwards, it's a specific prayer about us. It's great when you find these. You can put your name in. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's me and you. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world might know that you've sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Are you getting the repetition in Jesus' prayer here? He's trying to make it very, very clear that our oneness is powerful. That our togetherness is powerful. It is a message to the world. And it's never to be that, yeah, Jesus saved me and now I can live my own thing. No, you were saved for a purpose to belong to the church. That is your purpose. That is your spiritual destiny. We are living stones being built together. As it says in 1 Peter chapter 2. Into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. He says we're a chosen, not person, people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You can't read that and strictly apply it on just the personal level. It is a plural promise for us as the church. So let's be devoted to one another. As Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. I'd love us to break bread together. The wonderful power in this that Jesus decided to initiate a meal that can't be eaten on your own. <laughs> he put something in place, a promise of his presence within it. And said, whenever you come, break bread. And do it in remembrance of me. Actually, we have an opportunity this morning. I think we've got a little bit, we've got a little bit of time. To take bread and wine to one another. To go and bless one another. Go and pray your biggest prayers over someone. Remember Christ together as you take the bread, the body that was broken for you, as you take the wine, his blood poured out for you. If there's anything you need to sort out, you can sort it out. I'd urge you not to take the bread and the wine if you know you're holding on to something that needs to be dealt with. But this is a wonderful opportunity for us to meet with Jesus together as we break bread. It's a meal for those who've been baptised, any reason why you haven't been baptized then you should deal with that first but there's a real opportunity now for us to meet with God again as we break bread together John and Sheila would you mind helping me out on this table and Kevin and Sarah can you help me out on this one is that okay thank you very very much I'm going to pray for us and then I want to invite you to come up and uh, come and bless one another and serve one another father we thank you for the church Lord, we thank you for this miraculous thing Lord, that you've so committed yourselves to. Thank you that she is worth dying for. Thank you you did die for her, Lord. And thank you, Lord, that we're a part of it. Lord, I pray that our affections for you might grow. Lord, you might help each of us to draw closer to you on a personal level but Lord I pray corporately for Christ Central Church Lord would you take us deeper into unity Lord would you take us deeper into what it means to be family Lord would you be teaching us again anew Lord afresh what it means to be community Lord we want to be a sign and a wonder to the world 
Lord, we want those outside to marvel. How can these people meet and be so devoted to one another? Spirit, would you come and help us, we pray. Be glorified now, Lord. We pray that as we take this meal, as we break bread, and as we take the wine, Lord, that we would meet with you, that we would know your love for us, and Lord, that we might be able to bless one another. In Jesus' name, amen.